So we find ourselves in the last week of Psalm 23. If you don't have a Bible, the guys will come and pass one out, raise your hand, they'll get one to you. If you can't bear the embarrassment of raising your hand, there will be a Bible on the screen for you. Um, I haven't really been sure how I was going to start this one. I was listening to a sermon by uh, Francis Chan this week and kind of rocked my world. Um, He was talking at this church and he was talking about the glory of God. And Francis Chan, for those of you who don't know him, um, he's been a very successful uh, pastor. He's planted churches um, and man, he's led a lot of people to the Lord. Um, Very, very well-renowned pastor for those of you that aren't familiar with him. Um, but he was talking about what we want to see in our churches. And the context was he was talking out of Acts chapter 2. And it was fascinating to me. He was talking about when, when the, if you remember the Acts chapter 2, the context is the disciples had been waiting for Pentecost when the Holy Spirit would come upon them and empower them uh, to boldly proclaim God's name to the world, his name to the world. Um, and, And they're in this room, they're in this house, and the glory of God, his spirit, fills the house to overflowing. Fascinating, easy to, easy to kind of overlook. Um, and the, the things we overlook in scripture are just unbelievable sometimes. The glory of God. But he went on to talk about how easy it is to pack a room, to fill a room with people. Um, not just in our churches, we have lots of mega churches uh, around America and, and we pack them out. We have between four and 500 adults attend this church every week. Um, we have a church in Sandpoint, a campus in Sandpoint. And then when you factor in all the kids and everything, we're kind of responsible for like 700 to 1,000 souls, depending on who's there on any given day, um, which is fascinating. That's a lot of people. But he went on to say like anybody can fill a room. And I started thinking about that. Anybody can fill a room, right? Um, he, Taylor Swift packs out a room. Kanye West packs out a room. Obama packs out a room with, I don't know what, but he packs it out. (laughs) It's easy to fill a room. But Francis went on to say this. He said, I've gotten to a point in my life where filling a room isn't good enough for me. I want to see a room filled with God's glory. And I was like, done at that point when he said that. It's the most profound thing I've ever heard, I think. There comes a point where it's like, yeah, we can fill a room with a bunch of people. And the the reason I say that is we go through this series, and this is some of the most amazing text in the entire Bible, but so many of us will walk away completely unchanged, sitting underneath this text and allowing it to work on us, not allowing it to work on us. And when we talk about the glory of God, when we look through the Old Testament, when God's glory filled a room, no one could even go into the room. Like, like it, was, it was inexplicable. Moses would be out there at the tabernacle, and all of a sudden this cloud would descend, and not even Moses could go in there because the glory of the Lord. In fact, the one thing that Moses asked in Exodus chapter 33 is, God, would you show me your glory? Would you show me your glory? Do you realize that glory is, is the end of our faith? When we look in Romans chapter 8, glorification is the end of it. Those who who he called and he predestined and he elected, all these things, he also glorified. It's It's a done deal. For those of you who've put your faith in Jesus Christ, he's glorified you. Glory is the end of it, to to sit in his presence for eternity. Now, eternity is a long time. Forever is a long time. In fact, it's unfathomable, isn't it? And you have to ask the question, how can we be so certain about something so large? Because David says that he's going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's our text today. I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's an audacious statement if there ever was one. Because if you look at David's life, he did some jacked up things. How could this sinner... This man who had ripped people off, murdered people. He had kids that killed each other, raped each other, kicked him off of the throne. He had a mess of a life. 
Yet this man with, with a sure confidence can say, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I will. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Why? Because I have a super shepherd. Ultimately, when you read through Psalm 23, is God not a super shepherd? What kind of shepherd can guarantee your safety from predators? What kind of shepherd can prepare a table before you in the very presence of your enemies and you can sit there not worrying about somebody putting a knife in your back? That's a super shepherd. Because every shepherd that I've ever met has lost livestock. But, but Jesus says very concisely in John chapter 10, no one can get you out of my hand. No one. But of course, we're the exception to that rule. We are the someone that can pry ourselves out of God's hand. But he goes on to just kind of re-solidify it. You're also in my father's hand. And nobody, not a single person, can pry you out of his hand. You know, often, sometimes we think that our weakness is stronger than God's strength. What kind of strength is God's strength if our weakness can prevail against it? Think about that for a minute. I was really discouraged by something this last week, um, and, and, and I face that often. And I was just like, these people, these weak people, just makes me want to give up on ministry. And the Lord just, he's like, if their weakness is stronger than your strength, then what kind of strength do you have? That's a, that's a big question to ask, because how often do we give up on things because of somebody else's weakness? Because somebody else can't do it right, so we just walk away from the situation. Oh, this job's too hard now. This ministry's too hard now. This person I'm trying to lead to the Lord, they're so weak, I can't even reason with them. And we walk away, and what we realize is that our strength was never strength to begin with. We were actually weaker than the weak person. And thank God that God's strength is made perfect in our weakness because we're a bunch of feeble, weak people. I don't really know where I'm going with this, but I think, <laughs> I think ultimately... Um, when we look at this psalm, it's incredible. And the statements that David is making here in this last verse are, are unbelievable. And we've got to wrap our mind around it. You know, one thing that I've loved about this, this psalm as we've been going through is we haven't been just looking at what the word says. We've been looking at how do we actually accomplish it? How do we actually have faith in a situation? Because we can say, just have faith, brother. Just believe and you can move mountains. Just believe and you'll be healed. And we say all these things, and we have all these Christianese terms. If you're, if you're new to the church you ha and you haven't learned how to speak Christianese yet, you will. I pray for you, brother. Uh. But what if these words had a profound impact on our lives? What if as we abided in Jesus? In John 15, he says, and my word abides in you. What if his word abided in us? You know, Jesus in John 1, 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Wow. The glory of God. We beheld the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We beheld his glory. Everybody in Old Testament history wanted to see God's glory. And then Jesus, the word becomes flesh. And that word that can dwell in us as we abide in him becomes flesh. And we got to behold his glory. And every time we open the scriptures, every time we commune with Christ, every time that, that we pray to the Father in Jesus' name, we're beholding his glory. And his glory fills not just the room, but us. We're indwelled by the Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit, God himself, his glory resides within us and it should overflow out of us. And when we come together, Ephesians 2, man, I'm cutting into all my preaching stuff here. <laughs> ah, we're being built up, a dwelling place, a household for God to be in. So we're in Psalm 23 and we're gonna be in the sixth verse. I don't have time to recite this thing. We're gonna be in the sixth verse. David says, surely, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And we have this idea that we've been talking about the whole time of God's faithfulness even when we are faithless. We find this in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verses 9 through 13. When Paul says this to his young disciple Timothy who's facing extreme warfare. That's the context of this chapter. 
extreme spiritual warfare. He says, this is a faithful saying. For those days when you feel like giving up, Timothy, come back to the saying and read it and hold on to it and live it and read it again and hold on to it again and live it again because every day you're going to face new troubles, but sufficient is the day, the trouble for this one day. So just deal with this day. And he says this to him. This is a faithful saying. If we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. So David says, surely, surely, not maybe. He says, surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Goodness, of course, is simple. That's just goodness. It's just flat out good. Good is going to follow me. Good things are going to follow me. And he says, mercy, goodness and mercy are going to follow me all the days of my life. Now, mercy is your Hebrew word has said. That's where we get loving kindness, steadfast loving kindness, um, uh, mercy, faithfulness. These all come out of this word in the Hebrew. So he, he's saying goodness and faithfulness, loving kindness, patience. Those things are going to follow me all the days of my life. He says they will follow me. He doesn't say they may follow me. They might follow me if I do something right. He says, they're going to follow me. They will follow me. I know they will. I have this confident expectation. You know that's what hope is? It's a confident expectation. It's a legitimate understanding that God is who he says he is and he's going to do what he says he's going to do, even if it doesn't seem like it. And David says, not might, but it will follow me all the days of my life. Not just some days. Not just on the days that I perform well, on every single day of my life, God's goodness and his mercy, surely they will follow me. Surely they will follow me because God is faithful even when we are faithless. Maybe Paul even had this verse in mind as he penned that to his young disciple. I think it's important to remember though because sometimes we look at other people's lives and we see how wonderful they have it, right? We see how wonderful everybody else's life is. They're going on a vacation here. They're eating out there. They're catching 14 and a half pound catfish. Thank you. <laughs> it was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. And, and we look at people's lives and we see these, these snapshots, these glimmers of their life. And, and we look at David's life and we go, oh man, God even said he's a man after his own heart. But David had dark days. Yet David, even in his dark days, his kids being murdered, raped, uh, uh, his adultery, the, the murder of his friend, the, the times in the caves, David is reflecting back on all of this and saying, you know what, goodness and mercy every single day. The Bible tells us his mercies are new every single day. So it doesn't matter how bad you messed up the day before, his mercy is new today. Every single day, God is pouring his goodness and his mercy out upon you. And maybe you're going through something right now and you're saying, this is not good. This is not good. It's not good. Um, hmm. How can David say that? How can David, that's an audacious thing to say, isn't it? Goodness is going to, all the days of my life. The day that my friend died, goodness, mercy. The day that my parents got divorced, goodness, mercy. The day that guy just ripped me off for $100,000, goodness, mercy. Are you kidding me? Think about this statement for a moment. How can God, how can the walk with God be good all the time? How is it possible? When you get diagnosed, I'm just looking around the room and the things that I, I know about my friends in this room right now and the struggles that they face, a family that disowns you. It's good. Why? How? How? How can a man say God is good all the time? How? How? I don't get it. And I go back, as I reflect on this verse, I go back, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I go back to the man named Moses. 
And he's leading a couple million people, and it's just problem after problem after problem. In fact, he's up on Mount Sinai, and God gives him the Ten Commandments, and they're carved in the rock, and he's walking back to camp after 40 days. And here he comes with a big smile on his face, and Joshua is with him, and they hear something down in the camp. And Joshua rightly says, I hear the sound of war down in the camp. And, and Moses goes, no, it's Mary. They're, like, they're laughing and they're having fun. And, and, and they get down there and Aaron, who had been left in charge, had had everybody bring their gold to him and he made this golden calf and everybody is worshiping this golden calf. A thing made with hands. Everybody's worshiping it. And Joshua diagnosed it well on his way in. He said, there's a sound of war in the camp, but it wasn't the kind of war that you would think. It was spiritual warfare because sometimes laughter is war. Sometimes when you're celebrating and you're worshiping the wrong thing, there's excitement there. And rooms are packed with people worshiping celebrities on stages. Some of them call themselves churches. Some of them are just big arenas and they're rock stars. But that's the sound of war. Because people are dying and going to hell. But this man named Moses, after he calms down, after the Lord ministers to him, the Lord calls him back up on Mount Sinai. Do we have a picture of Mount Sinai? The Lord calls him back up on Mount Sinai. And, and Moses goes up there. He cuts two tablets of stone, and he goes up onto Mount Sinai. And, and his request in Exodus 33 was, Lord, show me your glory. And in verse 19, you guys don't have this, but I'm going to read it to you. God says back to him, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you can't see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. So it shall be while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face you shall not see. Put that picture of Mount Sinai back up. So this is a real place. Sometimes the Bible becomes, uh, becomes fictitious to us. This is a real place. Moses was on that mountain. And God was there. And Moses was there, and God was there, and God covered him with his hand and passed by him. And as he passes by him on that mountain, probably in the steep stuff where the mountain goats are, <laughs> somewhere on that mountain was a man named Moses and a God, his God, the faithful God, the true shepherd, the good shepherd. And he covers him with his hand, and he goes by him. And it says that the Lord descended in the cloud, verse 5 of chapter 34 in Exodus. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there. God stood with Moses and proclaimed the name of the Lord. What did he do? He, he told Moses who he was. A name is important, right? A name defines who we are. When I say Kenny, you think of Kenny. Maybe you think of a different Kenny. I'm thinking of this Kenny, that one right there. And I think of everything that he's done. I think of everything that he is. I think of his family. What he rep his name represents the man. And the Lord wants to tell his people who he is. And so he told Moses, this is who I am. This is my name. It's not just Lord. It's not just this simple, oh, he's Lord. Everybody, everybody calls their God Lord. Allah, Lord. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to get 70 virgins. <coughs> Joseph Smith, or whatever his name is. I'm going to... What, what is the name of their planet? Zoloft? <laughs> I don't even know. He's not just the Lord. He is the Lord. But his name is deep. And, and it defines who he is. And he proclaims his name to Moses. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed. Here's his name. You guys ready for this? The Lord. The Lord God, just in case you forgot, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. You following that? This is great. Merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And sometimes we want to cut God off right there. 
That's good. These are all good things. I can serve a God like that. Well, finish the verse. I've heard so many people preach this and cut the verse off at the comma. You never cut a verse off at the comma. That's just a pause before the bad news comes. <laughs> he says this, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. Okay, God is righteous. Not only is God merciful and, and good, do you see those terms in there? He's merciful and he's good, but he's also righteous. And without him, with him, without him, with him, without him, okay? That's how you're going to do in eternity. With him, without him. Without Jesus Christ, you will burn in hell. Because that is God's nature. And, and if you cut that verse off at the comma, you think God is good, he's merciful, he's going to forgive everything. But no, there's another side to God, the wrath of God on unrighteousness. Because he is holy and he's perfect and nothing unrighteous can approach him. He dwells in unapproachable light. So not, we have to understand that. And, and you've got to follow here what Moses does. He makes intercession just as Jesus does uh, for his people in the following verses. Verse 8, he says, So Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. That's your proper response to God, to worship him. Then he said, If now I have found grace in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us, even though we are a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity. Look, he, he visits the iniquity of the fathers on the sons, but Moses comes before him while he's standing on the rock in the presence of God, and he makes a petition to God. He makes intercession for his people. He says, please pardon their iniquity, and God grants it. And he says, I'm going to do an awesome thing through you. That's what he continues on to do. That's not what I'm here to preach on. But what I am here to preach on is the name of the Lord. Because David understood the name of the Lord. In other words, he understood the character of God. He understood that he was good and merciful. And, and that there was a way to salvation. There was a way to pardoning the iniquity. There was a way to that. Because God is merciful, but you must deal with him on his terms. The, the, other, the other aspect of good, so we have God is good. That's why goodness and mercy follow us all the days of his life, because that's who he is, and he is with us. He is for us, and he is not against us, so mercy follows us there. But what about the things that are just horrible and deplorable? I think back to, to Joseph. You remember Joseph in Genesis, who was sold into slavery by his brothers, he was thrown into prison. He was thrown into slavery. He was, he was all these different things. And he forgives his brothers. And he says this very poignant thing. He says, what you meant for evil when he comes face to face with his brothers again, after all the hurt, and maybe you've been hurt by somebody. And you can't bring yourself to say this, but Joseph could because he had a big God. And he says to his brothers, he says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good to make it as it is this day to save many people alive. That's why God allowed it to happen. And David had this paradigm, and we flash forward into Romans, a book written by the Apostle Paul, who, who was an apostle's apostle. In other words, he was a sent one from God. He, he preached the gospel. He planted churches. He empowered leaders. That's who Paul was. And he writes in Romans 8, on his discourse on election, he writes in Romans 8, verse 28, he says this, We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. He, we know that some things work together for good. What? All things. Fascinating. Fascinating. So this paradigm, that we begin to, to, to cultivate this idea that we can have, what, joy in any situation? That, that God is good all the time, and all the time God is good, right? We, we begin to understand that. We begin to understand what David's saying. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Even on the darkest days, even on the worst days, God is still in control. My weakness is not stronger than his strength. Good times. Good times. I want you to notice something else. As David follows the good shepherd, because the, the context here is a sheep in the good shepherd's care. As David followed the good shepherd, goodness and mercy followed him. As David followed the good shepherd, goodness and mercy followed him. What 
you are following, what is following you is determined by what you're following. What is following you is determined by what you are following. Let me put it this way. If you want to know what you are following, look behind you and see what's chasing you. If you want to know what you're following, for David, David's following the good shepherd. And and as he followed the good shepherd, goodness and mercy hedged him in on the backside. But what is chasing you? You want to know what you're following? Look behind you. Is a black cloud of doom and gloom following you everywhere you go? You run over here and the cloud goes. (laughs) Everywhere I go. (laughs) It's a black cloud. Let's get serious on this though now. Our divorce is following you everywhere you go. I have Christian brothers and sisters that is divorce after divorce and it's always the other person's fault. What are you following? What are you following? Our hangover's following you. You're not hung over as soon as you have some alcohol. The hangover follows. That's why they call it a hangover. Seriously, I, I don't say that jestingly. What is following you? It may be fun that night, but the next day you're gonna pay for it. And your lifetime may be a blast, but in eternity you're gonna pay for it. You just sit there and drink your life away on all the intoxicating things you can have, as much money as you can drink in, as much sex as you can drink in. Whatever it is, whatever your vice is, as much as you can drink in, drink it in. Just keep drinking it in. But you know what? In eternity, you're going to have the worst hangover ever as you burn in hell for it. What is following you? What is following your life? Is it goodness and mercy? Is it creditors and cops? Is it destruction and devastation? Is there a black cloud following you everywhere? I am, man, this is a convicting question for me. What's following you? Because what's following you, I'm not talking about persecution here. I'm talking about self-inflicted, reaping, sowing to the flesh, reaping of the flesh corruption. That's Galatians 6. That's what I'm talking about. What is following you? David says, as I follow the Lord, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. All the days of my life. He goes on to say this. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is where I want to just camp out the rest of the time. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever is a long time. We need to be sure about it because if we are going to live forever, if that's true, if we're going to live forever, we're going to live where we choose to live. And so we need to understand, David says, I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We need to understand three things. We need to understand what does it mean to dwell and how do we do it? That's one. What is the house of the Lord? Because I want to be there. And what is forever and how do I stay in his house forever? We need to know the answer to those three questions. If you don't have the answers to those three questions in your own life right now, there's a good chance you're headed for destruction and devastation. What does it mean to dwell in the house of the Lord? You know, dwelling in the house of the Lord was kind of a big thing to David. In fact, he wrote about it in multiple Psalms. Interestingly, he wrote about it in Psalm 37. Um, Psalm 37, verses three and four, he says, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Feed on his faithfulness. Faithful. That's the name of our, our series. Faithful. Feed on his faithfulness. Eat from him. Come to him. Verse four, delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Further on in Psalm 37, he says this in verse 27. He says, depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints. He doesn't forsake you who have put your faith in him. They are preserved. They are preserved. Remember that word because we're going to get to some preservatives later. They are preserved forever. But the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell in it for a couple of days. Forever. My favorite one, though, is in Psalm 27. 
in Psalm 27, he says, don't be, don't be envious of the, the workers of iniquity. So don't be envious of pagan people who are doing really well in life and they look like they're having all the joy. Don't be envious of the people on Facebook that are on vacation after vacation. Don't be envious of the pastor that catches a 14 and a half pound catfish. Don't worry about that stuff. Don't worry about that. I'm not bragging. I'm just, you know, bringing examples up. This, this, I'm just using my life as an example. He says, don't worry about that. That was in Psalm 37, actually. But in Psalm 27, he says this. One thing, verse 4, Psalm 27, verse 4. One thing, a single thing, a single purpose that I have, a single goal of mine, my big dream, my big idea, if life was perfect, this is the way it would be. One thing I have desired of the Lord. And that will I seek. Not only did he desire, he's making a commitment that I'm going to seek after this. He says this, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. If there was one thing, if there was a genie that could grant one wish, David says that I may dwell in the house of the Lord, but he would never say genie like I just said because he's got a God. And we don't have to wish to God. We can ask him for things in Jesus' name and he will give them to us as long as we are in alignment with his will. And so he says, one thing I've desired. Well, over in Psalm 37, he says that if you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. So David was delighted in the Lord and he desired that the Lord would allow him to live in his house forever. And the Lord would grant that. That's good. That's good. He says, one thing I have desired and that will I seek. If you were to ask David, David, tell me what you want, what you really, really want. He'd say, I'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want. I want to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Just tell you what I want, what I really, really want. I want to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Where do you want to dwell? Is it in the house of the Lord? Is that where you want to be? Is that, like the, is that the, the desire and the delight of your, your, your heart? And maybe I'm saying house of the Lord and you're thinking church building. We'll get to that in a moment. Because where you want to be is, also, is equally important. Like I desire to be in the house of the Lord. Well, you can just sit there in the foyer of the church 24-7 or you can actually live your life. I, I desire one thing, and I'm going to seek after it. I'm going to pursue it. He says, I desire to dwell in the house of the Lord. He, I desire to dwell every day in the house of the Lord, not just once a week. Maybe that's your, the, the, the climax of your interaction with the Lord is once a week, you come in here and you dwell for a couple of minutes and you're just uh, dwelling. Maybe you have sermophobia or whatever that was called. Homilophobia, fear of sermons. I want to behold his beauty. Wow. I want to behold his beauty. Behold means to observe a thing or a person, especially a remarkable or impressive one. In other words, David's saying, I want to be captivated by God all the days of my life. I want to be captivated by him. I just want to sit there in awe of God and everything that I do. That's what I want to do. That's what I'm here for. I just want to sit here and love the Lord my God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's what I want to do. And behold his beauty. Beauty actually in the Hebrew means kindness, pleasantness, delightfulness, and favor. He wants to, he wants to behold his kindness and his pleasantness. I want you to look at the context of Psalm 27 real quick. The context of Psalm 27 isn't good times. It's not good times. In fact, uh, this Psalm was written by David. Um, probably most scholars believe either when Saul was hunting him or after Absalom had kicked him off of the throne. And, and David writes Psalm 27, uh, which is just fascinating. But in verses one through three, he says this, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? meaning that there was enemies all around, but since God is with me, who do I need to fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? What kind of weakness can prevail against my God's strength? Nothing. Who do I need to be afraid of? What do I need to be afraid of? When the wicked came against me, 
It's not all rainbows and butterflies for the Christian. When the wicked come against you to eat up his flesh, my enemies and my foes, they stumbled and fell. Why? Because God stumbled them. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war may rise against me. In this, I will be confident. I want you to notice the beginning of that verse, verse three in Psalm 27. He says, though an army may encamp against me, often, often, the war doesn't actually rage against us, but the army camps right over there and you just sit there looking at their tents, just wondering when they're gonna come over the hill. And, and that's the way it is with big problems in our lives, right? They seem to, they don't always hit us full on. They camp out right here on the edge, just so we can see them. Our problems just camp out there and they look at us and they come out for 40 days and they're like, send me a man to fight me. And you're back there, I can't do it. Please, please, not me, anyone else. But David says, regardless of any of that, I, I, don't, I don't desire to win the battle. I don't desire any of that. The one desire I have, the one desire I have, because I know God's already dealt with all these other things. The one desire I have is that I would be with him forever. That's it. I just want to dwell in his house forever. To dwell, to dwell. Oh, I can't skip ahead. My goodness, sorry. We have to make a decision to be planted in God's house. Psalm 92 verse 13 says this, those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord. Are you planted in the house of the Lord? Are your roots down? Are your roots down here with the Lord? Are you down with the Lord? Are you plugged in to his church? I'm gonna to get to that in a moment. But we have to make a decision to be planted in God's house. Not a wish, not a one day, not a I hope I'm planted in God's house. I am planted, I will dwell forever in it. But what does it look like to dwell? If it's so important, if it's so important to David, if it's important to our eternity, what it, looks, what it means to dwell, we need to understand that. How do we do it and where do we do it? So dwelling, dwell means to dwell or to remain, to sit or abide. Fascinating that we would see abide there. Abide in the Lord. We go over to John 15. Do you remember John 15? You remember Jesus? Okay, John 15, for those of you who don't know, there's this, this, um, this, this, he's about to go to the cross in John 15. And he's telling his disciples what he's after, he wants them to do. And in John 15, he says this. Hold on, I gotta turn there. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. This is verse one. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me. Here it is. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Have you ever seen a branch broken off of a tree, a fruit tree? and it's sitting out there on the lawn. After a couple of weeks, what happens to the leaves? They're all dead. Are there apples growing on it? Why? Because it's not connected to the tree. And that's what he says. If you're not connected to me, you're done for. Your leaves may be green for 70 years, but after that, we're gonna gather you up and we're gonna burn you. Because that's what we do with dead branches. And he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, by this, by, by my word abiding in you and you abiding with me, by you being plugged in with Jesus, by this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. And he goes on because it's very unclear here. Okay, so we got the word, that's how we abide in him. I don't get it. Because so, to abide means to dwell with him. I, I'm still unclear as to what it means to actually dwell with the Lord, right? Okay, so his words got to be in my heart. What does that mean? I just read it. Do I photocopy it on there? Do I stick it on with pins? How, how do I put this word uh, on my heart? But Jesus actually continues on. He doesn't leave us abandoned here in the text, he clarifies, he says this, as the father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love, abide in my love. 
If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So the first thing is, is the word. This is how we abide with, with the Lord as we spend time in the word and we intake the word. But the second one here is that we keep his commandments. Fascinating. Well, I want to know what commandments they are, that he's talking about because he could be talking about the Ten Commandments. Those are really hard to keep. Those are almost impossible. But actually, he's talking about a harder commandment. The context of this is a harder commandment to keep. And he's going to go on and he's going to explain it right now. He says, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Do you want fullness of joy? Isn't that what we're all pursuing is joy in life? The joy comes from abiding in Jesus. He says, this is my commandment. I'm not going to make you look around. Here it is right here. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Love one another as I have loved you. He goes on to say, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. He says, you are my friends. And he reaffirms it in verse 17. He says, these things I command you, that you love one another. Of course, over in John 13... 35, he says, you will prove to the world you are my disciples by your love for one another. This is how we abide in the Lord. This is how we dwell with him. David says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is how we dwell. To dwell means to live as a resident somewhere. To live as a resident. I want you to note that. To live as a resident. That's what it means to dwell. So when David says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, what he's saying is, I will live as a resident in the house of the Lord forever. How many of you have been to an amazing ranch in your life? I've been to a number of just beautiful, huge ranches, and I stand there and I enjoy them. I even drink coffee with my friends on them. And I look over it, but you know what happens when the vacation's up? I leave. I'm not a resident at that house. I'm not a resident on that ranch. And God's house is a place that you want to be a resident of. God's house is a place that you want to be a resident of. If you're not a resident, you will leave. And maybe you just visit God's house. Maybe you visit every once in a while and you admire the views. You love the sermons. You love the, 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 the word of God has great takeaways that you can apply to your life, but you're just visiting it and you visit the word, but it doesn't abide in your heart. You visit it, it, it overflows you. It goes right past you and you think, oh, that's pretty nice, but it doesn't abide in you. You're not dwelling in it. And when you get back in the car and you drive off, it's all you ever get to see of it is in the rear view mirror. And I, I think over to Luke, I believe chapter 11 of the rich man and Lazarus or whatever however it goes. And he's in Hades, the rich man is in Hades and he's, he's, he's looking up and he's begging for just a drop of water, just a drop of water. There's a picture right there of the rear view mirror as you drive away from the house of the Lord. He died and, and he, he's out of God's presence and, and he's looking back and he's desiring just a drop of God's goodness. Just another moment on that porch that he visited and never dwelled. Are you visiting the house of the Lord? Or are you dwelling in it? Now the house of the Lord, house in the Hebrew is just a plain old house. Nothing special about the, the word that David used here. It's ordinary. And that's the point, isn't it? That us as ordinary people, this building that was a grocery store was an ordinary building. But now when God's glory fills the room, it becomes extraordinary. I dwell in the house of the Lord. He's not talking about a house. He's not talking about a building. You know, we look in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and he says, you are the temple you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, God, the Spirit, dwelling within you. You've been purchased at a price. You, you're the house of the Lord. You're the house of the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 2, he says this, Paul says this in verse 19. He says, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners. You're not just visiting God. You haven't just heard about God. Now you see him with your eyes. You're no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the what? The household of God. Members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief 
cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together. So what he's talking about here is the gathering of the saints that we're not supposed to forsake according to Hebrews. You're not supposed to forsake the gathering of the saints. You may be the temple of the Lord, but God has bigger plans. He wants to stack person on top of person in a room. Not only does he want to fill the room full of his glory, he wants to fill the room full of people that are full of his glory. God is a God of numbers. Otherwise, he wouldn't say in Acts that 3,000 and 5,000 and all these thousands of people were added to the church. It's important. Salvation is important to God. And not only does he want to fill the building with his glory, he wants to fill the building with his people that are full of his glory. And Ephesians 2 here says that he's taking person after person after person and he's stacking them together in the house of the Lord. He's uniting them, bringing them together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. Do you see this right there in the text? In whom you also are being built together, together together. Together, not individually, not by yourselves, not us four and no more, not kumbaya in the backyard. You come here, you come together, and you get together, and you allow God to build you. And it doesn't matter if somebody has a stinky butt and they're on your face. It doesn't matter. God is stacking you on top of each other. And you don't like that I just said that, but it's very true because we are people and sheep stink. Sheep stink. And sometimes it's not pleasant, but there's a greater purpose that, that trumps the pleasantries. And sometimes we want the whole thing to be pleasant. We want everything to be just right and on our terms in the way that we like it. And we want Justin to say exactly how we think he should say it. But even Paul used some harsh words in Philippians. And that's the fact of the matter. And we can cringe at that. But the fact is, statistically speaking, most of you have left another fellowship of Christians, another church, because you didn't like what somebody did. But you know what God says about that? He says, I'm putting you guys together. I'm not talking about heresy. I'm not talking about bad, I'm not talking about bad churches. I'm talking about, oh, I don't like them. So I just don't attend that church anymore because there's a hypocrite that goes there. Get over yourself and get stacked. Get stacked so God can fall on the place and fill it with his glory. Amen? So, to dwell in the house of the Lord is this. It's to commit your life entirely to the Lord. Paul says in Romans 10, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that he has been raised from the dead. Confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and you will be saved. That's the first part of dwelling in God's house. The second part is the word has to be in your heart. You're reading the word. You're listening to the word. We went over a series on the word that's abiding in him. To love others is abiding in him. As you dwell in the house of the Lord, that, that means you don't keep a list of wrongs and you let things go and you're gracious and you're merciful and you have the Christ-like character. And number three is you commit to his church. You commit to his church. That's not a building, that's a people. That's a people group. We commit to his church. And you know what? It's so easy to not commit because it's hard, because it is stinky, because it's a mess, because wherever Jesus is and life is, there is a mess that follows it. There's a mess. Jesus preaching in the house in Mark 2. And there's not enough room in the house. And so people that want to access Jesus go ahead and boost each other up on the roof and rip the roof off. Don't you think that was a mess? I mean, it probably rained the next day. <laughs> it is a mess wherever God's people are. It's a, it's a sheep sty. I don't even know if that's a word. <laughs> it's a sheep sty. I'm going to wrap up with this. How can David say forever? How can David say forever? Forever is a long time. He says, surely. Sure, do, do, you, do you hear the language here? Surely. Like unequivocally, yes, it's going to happen. I'm absolutely positive of this, that goodness and mercy are going to follow me all the days of my life. And I, I am going to, I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's where I'm going. Where are you guys going? You're going to? Who's coming with me? All right. Why didn't some of you raise your hands? <laughs> <laughs> so 
So, are you guys familiar with canning? We live in Bonners Ferry. For those of you who don't know how to can, you're going to get to know how to soon. <clears throat> so this here is raspberry jam, made a few years ago. If I was to open it up right now, I'd be able to open it, pop the lid off, and eat the jam. That's, that's fascinating because have you ever seen a raspberry that doesn't get picked? Or just a raspberry that doesn't get canned, how, how long does it last? <coughs> Days? And then what happens to it? Weird, isn't it? It rots. But this, the, these raspberries, I, I could open it right now, but I'm going to save that for second service because I like them more. <laughs> I'm just joking. I actually like you guys the best, but don't tell them I said that. <laughs> these raspberries have been in here for years. In fact, uh, my friend Shane, who you probably hear me talk about all the time, um, he's got the beard that my beard wants to be like. Um, he has a sister. And over 30 years ago, which was back in the 80s, mind you, she picked huckleberries once in her life. She is still eating the same huckleberries that she picked 30 years. I don't even know if that's safe. But she's still eating them. You know why? Because she canned them. Do you know what the most important process in the canning is? Well, it's kind of a two-part thing, but canning won't work without something happening. You can't just put a bunch of raspberries in a jar and close it up and put it on the shelf. You'll have rotten raspberry whatever. You can't do that. The most important part to canning is you have to heat it up. You have to heat it up, and you don't really notice a difference in the fruit, like for instance, if you were to can peaches, the peach slices look great still. They look whole. But the, the, you put this in, in hot water with, j with jam, you'll, you'll cook the jam down um, first. But you'll put this, this jar in hot water and it gets up to temperature. And what, what's happening there is it kills molds, yeasts, and bacteria and enzymes that will make the fruit rot. That's what it, when you heat it up, it actually kills it. So this process happens that you can't really necessarily observe, especially when you're talking about whole things that you're canning. You can't really observe it, but this process of heating up happens and it kills all the bacteria that are killing, in other words, destroying the very fruit that you're trying to preserve. There's this bacteria in there, these enzymes in there, that until the heat is applied, they are on the warpath to destroy the fruit. And we know from nature that it will be destroyed unless something happens that's outside of the fruit's control. Have you ever seen a raspberry preserve itself? Why not? You've, hold on, you've never seen a raspberry just uh, jump off the vine, <laughs> veggie tail style, pop, 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 and jump in a can and preserve itself? You've never seen that. Are these raspberries continuing to preserve themselves? So hold on. They couldn't preserve themselves to begin with, and they can't keep themselves preserved. It's the work of what? The person who did it. The person who preserves them. And then, do you know what happens after it's heated and all the bacteria, the, the sin that is killing and decaying this goes away? You know what happens? You pull it out, and, and this lid on here... There, there's a rubber gasket underneath this lid right here. And it's what's called sealing. Fascinating. Sealing it. And, and as it cools down, see, when you heat something up, it expands. But when you cool it down, it contracts. And you put this lid on there, and the contraction sucks the lid on and literally seals it until you want to open it up on the right day and enjoy it. Fascinatingly, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 says this. In whom, talking about Jesus, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. You trusted him. The gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. David could say, I will dwell in the house of the Lord 
because he was preserved by the Lord and he was sealed by the Lord. When we talk about being sealed by the spirit, the spirit is our guarantee. God's spirit dwelling within you. You wanna talk about the glory of God? The glory of God dwells in the house of the Lord. You are that house. You are that house and he is going to dwell in you. He's going to preserve you. He is going to kill all the bacteria and get this about the sealing. Are you ready? This is the best part about sealing. Your preservatives now keep safely as the vacuum seal prevents microorganisms and air from re-entering the jar and contaminating the contents. So when you are sealed with the Holy Spirit, God prevents, he prevents the damage and the death that, and destruction that sin brings to come back into you and destroy you. That's why he can say in John chapter 10, that you, my friends, who have put your faith in the good shepherd, you are in my father's hands and no one, no one can pluck you. Is that cool? Faithful. God is faithful. Here's the deal. You can't get in that jar by yourself. You can't open that jar once you're in it. I have never seen a raspberry open a jar. <laughs> My encouragement as we close this psalm is David was not a perfect man. But David was a confident man. He understood that his weakness was not stronger than God's strength. David understood his own limitations, that despite the wrong that he had done, he cannot open this jar. David understood that. And verse six is a testimony to what David understood of the Lord's faithfulness. He said about the Lord, being his sheep in his fold, he said, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I, I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's where I'm going to be. I pray that as we close this, that is where you would be as well. If you're just visiting this morning, if you're just visiting the house of the Lord, I would challenge you to pick up your roots and plant them firmly here. If you, if you don't really like the church, well, the problem is, is Jesus kind of liked it. In, in fact, in Ephesians 5, it says he loved his church so much that he gave himself for her. You got to love something a lot to die for it. So if you don't love what Jesus loves, blemishes and all, because Jesus still loves his church and the gates of hell aren't going to prevail against it. If the hypocrites keep you out, are you saying that the hypocrites are stronger than you? I challenge you to plant your roots here. And if not here, if you don't like me and my preaching, plant yourself somewhere else. But be a part of Jesus's church. Be a part of Jesus's church. It's, there's not gonna be a perfect one. We're not in glory till heaven. Amen? Let's close in prayer. Lord, you are good and you're amazing and you're loving and kind and I just praise you for what you're doing in our lives. I pray, Lord, um, I pray for my friends that are in here right now, Lord. I know that reality is some of us are struggling. Most of us are probably struggling with something, Lord, and I pray that you would minister to that. Lord, I pray if it's fear that we won't get to dwell in your house, Lord, I pray that you would alleviate that, that the sealing of your spirit would encourage us and Lord, I just pray uh, that you would do ministry in words that I can't even say right now. In Jesus' name, amen.